Large cap stocks adrift again as risk wells for an unwind and upside momentum. That's a bit of a tongue teaser. That, that is. That was hard. You <laughs> live, wrote it. <laughs> live from Studio Two here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York. I'm Romain Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. But you know what? Small yeah. caps. Small yeah. caps doing really well. We're going to focus on that throughout yeah. the next uh, couple hours. We're kicking you off here to the closing bell right here in the U.S. S&P goes nowhere fast, but it's energy, industrials, materials. They're doing really well within the S&P. Henceforth, example, Freeport, McMoran, Copper and Gold. That's really a copper and a gold story. It's the best performing stock within the S&P. A 30-year yield auction, it was $22 billion. It actually did pretty much okay compared to, say, the three-year and the 10-year that we saw earlier in the week. So we have yields uh, up by about three basis points, but nothing to write home about. But we are, uh, for the 10-year, at least over that 200-day moving average. So watch some technical levels. And speaking of... The majority of the commodity complex, like a stealth rally over the last two months. You got crude up almost 3%, almost right now hitting $80 a barrel, Romain. Yeah, that's a big story here on the day in the commodity space. We're going to get to that in just a second here on the show. It's kind of funny because everyone today was really so focused on that softness that we are seeing in those large cap and those big cap tech stocks. But ignoring the relatively strong bid that's going into mid and small size stocks. The biggest volume mover today across all of the tapes, a $2 billion market cap company. Soundhow AI. And the biggest percent gainer out there, the $18 billion retailer, William Sonoma. In fact, the Bloomberg terminal is showing that of the roughly 284 stocks that hit 52 week highs today, 40% of those names had market caps of less than $5 billion, and 72% of them had valuations under 25. In fact, Bloomberg actually has a value ranking score. It takes into account a lot of things like cash flow, market cap, enterprise metrics. The lower the number, the better the potential value. Remember that. NVIDIA's score as of last week was 951 among the highest for large cap stocks. To put that into perspective, home builder Lennar, which reports earnings tonight, had a score of 104. And General Motors, nine. Wow. I had a chance to catch up with Ariel Investments founder John Rogers on Monday. He actually said that historically, when you have that type of gulf in a discount and disparity, well, inexpensive stocks end up posting stronger performance over the subsequent two years. But in that conversation, there was still the lingering question of timing. The timing of when small cap earnings will indeed support small cap stock outperformance. The good news, though, is maybe you at least don't need to worry about the Fed. At least that's the take from Bloomberg equity strategist Chris Kane, who in a note just today pointed out that while interest rates and value stocks did move together in lockstep in 2021, that relationship has completely broken down, meaning value stocks in general, Alex, can dance to their own drummer, at least for now. And maybe that drum is good. Like, maybe that drum yeah. is producing profits. I'm trying to think of a musical analogy, but <laughs> I don't have it. Um, and this is wh where I get that information. So this is the Russell 2000. This is how much the average sales growth we saw in the last quarter for all the sectors within the Russell 2000. And you can see weak growth all across 2023. And then boom, we see some nice growth here. Here we're seeing the growth in the second quarter of 2024, and then more growth as we go on throughout the whole year. And that just shows that maybe the move we've seen in the Russell is being supported by real earnings growth. Not necessarily beats, right? Because you can kind of finagle that, but actual profit growth. The only sector that hasn't contributed to that growth is communications. Every other sector, not just tech, but energies, industrials, et cetera, have all been doing quite well in the Russell Russell's earnings season remain. Yeah, I mean, look, and this is kind of what creates that disparity, but it also creates a disparity in opinions and more importantly, a disparity in manager performance. So the question is, where do you go as an investor? Jason Trenner joining us right now to help us kick off to the close here on this Wednesday afternoon is the chairman uh, and CEO over at Strategus Research Partners. And Jason, I do want to start off with this, uh, I guess, somewhat mild rotation that we've been seeing into cyclical names, into small cap names, into value names. It appears to be uh, I guess a somewhat cautious rotation, but definitely there seems to be some momentum behind it. People want to find something beyond just the Magnificent Seven. You know, I think that's right, and I think people are generally coming to the conclusion that uh, the chances of a recession are, are declining. And certainly that was still, I, I think there, there are still questions about it, but the most likely scenario for most people uh, is that there's going to be a soft landing. 
Uh, if anything, the U.S. economy certainly seems among to be the strongest uh, in the world. And so I think people have a little bit more confidence uh, in some ways just moving away from things that uh, they know will provide them growth uh, that uh, regardless, uh, which is tech. And now they're, they're focusing on things that are a little bit more cyclical and a little more dependent upon uh, a continuation of the business cycle. Absolutely. And in fact, a lot of those names that, of course, got sold off pretty hard in 2022 and, 20, and even in part of 2023 when everybody thought we were headed off some sort of economic cliff. That's not materialized, and most estimates, at least by the smart folks on the street, don't seem that's going to show up this year at all. Uh, when we start to talk about what the Fed is going to do, and more importantly, how the Fed's decision will affect risk assets, how, much, how strong is that correlation right now? Well, I mean, listen, I think at the start of the year, uh, the general expectation is the Fed would, would tighten six times. Uh, now it's probably around three. Uh, if you look at the dot plots, my own opinion, for whatever it's worth, is that, um, like, um, like Mr. Waller, I, I'm kind of in the what's the rush uh, category because the stock market's hitting all-time highs. Uh, bond yields seem to be beha behaved. Um, you have gold, Bitcoin, copper uh, hitting, you know, breaking out. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's a big rush to me um, to, uh, to ease, uh, and yet there is an expectation in the marketplace that they do so. So my expectation is that they will ease. It just may not be as, as much as people had expected uh, even a couple of weeks ago. What about not at all, Jason? Um, Torsten Slock over at Apollo are, thinks that yes. Jeffries also pointed out that, look, if we continue to see this positive data, the economy is still capacity constrained. So any kind of tick up in demand will then raise the risk of renewed bout of inflation. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of more in that camp. And, and I, th I, can't, I don't think we can forget the fact that uh, there is no coordination between fiscal and monetary policy. Uh, we're, we're talking about deficits that are about 7 percent of GDP, right. which we, we've only done in periods when the unemployment rate was above 7 percent. We've never done that when the unemployment rate was below four. So I, I, my own opinion is the Fed may be a little overconfident here, or maybe the Fed was getting overconfident. I understand there's a lot of pressure uh, on them, and that there's a, a very strong tendency to want to fine-tune monetary policy. But I, I have to say, uh, with all due respect to the people on the FOMC, um, I, I, just, I, I think that's beyond human uh, abilities to, to fine tune an economy this this complex. I, I would try to keep it more simple, but I, I doubt that's what they're going to do. I think they're going to try to thread the needle here, which makes me wonder whether there might be another round of inflation, another wave of inflation, as we get into 2025. Uh, okay, so you think we're of the mind that maybe we'll see cuts, trigger inflation, and then we'll have to hike again next year? Well, listen, I think you, I, I don't I certainly wouldn't declare any big victory laps over inflation if I were the Fed. It, it has come down from nine to three. And that, that's something that is is good, uh, certainly. But as you pointed out, um, there are a lot of other indications that you're certainly a long way from two, I, I believe, which is the is the standard, uh, allegedly. Um, no one really thinks they're going to uh, have some sort of suicide pact with two. But certainly, I, I would think you'd need to get a little bit closer before you really start um, spiking the football. So I, I would be, I, I'm a little nervous about what you just described. Uh, I don't know if they'll tighten next year, but I do think um, uh, another wave of inflation is, if history is any guide, is, is quite likely. All right, uh, Jason, always great to talk to you. Jason Trenner there helping us kick off to the close. Chairman and CEO over at Strategus Research Partners. A lot more coming up here on the big program, including a big day for TikTok, but maybe not what they expected. The U.S. House of Representatives passing a bill to ban TikTok. And just now, the spokesman over at the White House saying that if it passes the Senate, the president will sign it. A deeper dive into the app and the millions of users affected by this new law. All right, plus you got U.S. Steel tumbling after reports that President Biden will oppose a planned takeover of the firm by Nippon Steel. Not entirely surprised by that, but that's not really moving. We'll have the latest. And a focus on commodities today with Natasha Kaneva, head of global commodity strategy over at J.P. Morgan. We'll talk about copper. We'll talk about steel and, of course, some of the interesting moves we've been seeing in the oil market. All that and more coming up in just a bit. This is The Close on Bloomberg.
to larger industries are doing great, up double digits for four straight quarters. But if you go down to the grassroots level, for mechanics and other people, people who are in factories, they are trouble. You have people in the grassroots who are cash rich. Yeah. Their salaries are going up, they're, but their confidence poor. And so what happens in those situations is they pivot towards shorter payback items. That was Nick Pinchuk, CEO of Snap-on Incorporated, speaking with us yesterday about his views on the economy. Nervous, cash rich, but not going to do much with it because you're scared. So want to get another perspective from the C-suite. Joining us now is Scott Salmiers, president and CEO of ABM Industries, one of the world's largest providers of facility services and solutions. So we're talking like air conditioning, janitorial services, lighting, parking, security, all the guts of the stuff you need to run a building. That's right. That's Thanks us. for being here. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so give us the ten thousand foot view. Like, how's it going? How's demand? How do you? What's your visibility for this year? Yeah. So we're, we're optimistic, right? And to give you context about ABM, you know, we're again hundred years old, uh, Fortune five hundred company, and uh, one hundred twenty thousand employees. And it, it, it's amazing that we started with one person with a uh, a, a bucket and a squeegee cleaning sh <laughs> retail windows, and now here we are, and we have a really good purview because of the industries we serve because we're in commercial real estate, we're in aviation, education, and manufacturing and distribution, mm -hmm. which is so hot right now. So we're optimistic and, you know, there's definitely an overhang on commercial real estate, mm -hmm. but we have, we have good insight because we have relationships with tens of thousands of tenants across the country and the hybrid is here to stay but there's definitely a move back to the office and it's palpable. Mm -hmm. I think a couple of years ago it was one to two days a week right. and it's mm -hmm. two to three. Yeah. Now we really feel like it's three to four. So, mm -hmm. But does that not affect your business? I mean, if, uh, if a building's full five days a week like pre-pandemic and it now goes down to being completely full, say three days a week, does that change what you are there to do? Well, it puts a little compression on us because when yeah. tenants compress their space, yeah. right, we feel it. But because of our labor model, if a tenant takes less space, we can furlough the staff or put them in another location. So our margins stay relatively strong. Mm -hmm. And even with all the compression that's going on, which isn't as dramatic as people thought, because two years ago, we thought every tenant was going to take half as much space. And it's really not playing out that way. Mm -hmm. It's turning out to be 10 to 20 percent less. So for us, we're really resilient. And this past quarter, our revenues in commercial real estate were flat year over year. Yeah. So we're not feeling it as much as you would think. Huh. Where are, where's the good part? So commercial real estate challenge, but like you're hanging in. Where are things really strong? Class A. So all real estate is not created equal, mm -hmm. right? Class A space is actually pretty much thriving right now. It's the B and C space, the older space, the ones that need retrofits. And let's go back to my compression point. So if a tenant is taking 20% less space, right, but they could still spend the same amount of money on rent, mm -hmm. they can upgrade yeah. to a better building, to mm -hmm. a class A building, which as you guys know, is so important for retaining employees, for attracting employees. So there's this major shift towards class A and it's, it's proven out to be very resilient. So that's sort of the lay of the land of what we're seeing in office real estate. Obviously, you do a lot more than that. That's right. Airports, entertainment venues, things like that. What, though, is the future when we start to talk about the next generation of commercial real estate? I assume that's not going to be gleaming new office buildings. It's going to be yeah. something a little bit different. What? Yeah, well, I, do, I am optimistic about mm -hmm. commercial office buildings. I think it's just going to take a little time. Right now, it's manufacturing and distribution facilities, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. With the semiconductor business coming across, with the chips Act, which I, I know you guys know about. I mean, right now, we're servicing 10 of the biggest semiconductor companies in the world. We had our executives over in Korea last month mm -hmm. talking to other semiconductor companies about onshoring to the U.S. Mm -hmm. and, and again, this is so interesting. I don't think people realize when they think about a semiconductor facility, mm -hmm. uh, it would probably surprise you to know they're the size of two, three, four, five football fields. I mean, these are massive facilities. Yeah, it's incredible. And the pandemic really showed us the fragility in the supply chain with semiconductors. So yeah. I think that's really exciting and part of our future. And we're already seeing some of that build out, or at least the, the sort of the early stages that's of that. That's right. Another big infrastructure project that was also tied to the CHIPS Act and has been uh, ballyhooed out of Washington is building out more of a electric vehicle charging yes. network. Anyone who owns an EV that's not a Tesla knows 
the troubles that's that right. you're going to have out there if you try to drive more than like 10 miles. Right, right. Yeah, yeah it's, you know, they have a name for it, range fear. Yeah. Right, so people have it and they're, where am I going to get to a charger? Mm -hmm. And there's just not enough infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? So hopefully the Infrastructure Investment Act, yeah. they have $7.5 billion allocated right. to EV infrastructure. Yeah. That's going to be a big catalyst because... What? There is demand for EVs. People yeah. want them, yeah. but they need more infrastructure. So it's coming. It's yeah. coming. And our backlog at ABM is starting to soar. So what am I looking at here on the screen? Are you making the actual chargers? We are. Yeah. We are. We're designing them. Mm -hmm. We're making them. And we have the brains inside of them as well. Yeah. So it's a complete turnkey solution. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not only just the yeah. residential consumers. Yeah. It's also the big fleets. Yeah. Because everyone's put their carbon protocols out, right, right. for carbon reduction. Yeah. One of the easiest ways to do that is by changing your fleet out. And just real quickly, so are your customers on the EV side, EV charging side, are they mostly private residences and private uh, we don't do uh, residential uh, it's uh, all commercial it's so all it's commercial dealerships okay and then fleet and fleet yeah okay uh interesting uh stuff uh scott we have to get you back to talk a little bit more about that a big topic uh, for us here on the show that's the ceo over at abm industries a much uh broader company with a great read here on what's going on on the ground when it comes to commercial real estate coming up here on the big show we're going to get you a read on the housing market we do get some earnings after the bell including out of lennar we're going to talk to an analyst and get his view on what to expect our top calls up next on the close right here on bloomberg All right, let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls. Big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we're going to start off with Tesla, the ultimate growth stock, not showing much growth as of late. That's at least the opinion of analysts over at Wells Fargo, cutting their recommendation to underweight. Tesla now has 13 sell equivalent ratings. That's more than double the number from just 11 months ago. The analyst over there, Colin Langan, says Tesla's strategy of cutting prices to boost demand, that's played out. And he expects volumes to remain flat this year and fall next year. Shares down about 4% here on the day, a 30 plus percent drop to start the year. Next in line, Texas Roadhouse, an upgrade today to outperform over at Baird for what the analyst calls standout traffic at its restaurants. He says the shares still have plenty of room to run, even with the recent strength factored in. The analyst raising the price target to 175 bucks. That implies a 12% rise from current levels, that would be significant considering that 155.30 is set to close at a record high today. And finally, let's take a look at TriPoint Homes, an upgrade to outperform from sector perform over at RBC. The price target set at 38. The analyst citing improved pricing for the home builder, and he expects that strength to translate into gross margin and profit upside as the year progressive. TriPoint, of course, focuses almost exclusively on those high growth areas in California and the U.S. Southwest and investors right now focus in on this stock. A nice bump here up about 3 percent. The best day for that stock since late January. Those are some of our top calls, but we want to stay in the housing space because we are expected to get results out of a much more national home builder. That is Lennar. Those results set to drop in just about an hour. New home orders and closings expected to rise, giving the home builders focus on volume growth. As far as gross margin, though, some analysts are expecting last quarter to maybe be a low point. Tyler Batori joining us right now. He's executive director and an analyst over at Oppenheimer. He's got a market perform rating on the shares. And Tyler, Lennar, and really the rest of the home builder space, really one of the standout, uh, if not kind of surprising moves higher that we saw in 2023. When we look at that momentum in the shares, how does that carry over into 2024 based on the earnings that we've seen so far? Yeah, well, certainly we'll find out an hour from now when Lennar does report earnings. I think a little bit of a tricky setup for the stock here heading into the print. There's some, some good news and some bad news. On the good side of things, we do think that demand for new homes has remained strong into March. Lennar is a very volume-focused builder, so they should be well-positioned to take advantage of that. Wouldn't be surprised if the number of homes that they close, if their orders in Q1 are better than expected, also would anticipate their commentary the rest of the year to actually be pretty positive as well. Mm -hmm. The bad news and the risk we think is really around gross margin, because at the end of the day, it's one thing to sell more homes yeah. than Wall Street expects. It's another thing to sell them well, at a lower margin than Wall Street expects. And that's really where I think there could be some risk. Here. Well, that's what I'm curious about, and particularly what you would ask on the conference call, because management has made it clear that that volume strategy is their strategy. Now, I'm not sure if they're saying that's going to be 
intentionally at the expense of profitability. But when you're trying to grow that fast, uh, particularly at a time when the metrics, the unit metrics, maybe are maybe starting to work against you, do you still stick by that strategy? Well, we'll see what happens. If you take a step back and you just look at what Lennar is trying to do, they're really trying to have a consistent sales cadence in terms of the number of homes that they're selling. And they're willing to fluctuate with their gross margin, really fluctuate with price and incentives to hit that consistent target. And if you take a step back and you look at this, if you can sell more homes, in theory, you should be able to take market share. You can leverage some of those sales on top of your fixed costs. You can also get more efficient in terms of your land strategy. And over the long term, I don't necessarily debate the merits of the strategy. The problem is quarter to quarter, Wall Street's still very focused on gross margin. Mm -hmm. They're very focused on earnings. So if you have a business model where there's potentially some inherent volatility in those metrics, that's where the risk comes in. That's why we think it's a little bit tougher to own this stock here. Well, I mean, is it a 52 week high? looks like it actually is a record high. It has a tremendous run. Is there any catalyst, though, we might see that could justify this move? I appreciate you're skeptical, but is there something like if the margin story isn't terrible or if the concessions that they've been offering kind of get thrown on the back burner? Yeah, so I think a lot of this is really going to depend on what they guide Mm -hmm. for Q2. If you think of what they're going to report, they're going to be reporting earnings through February. In December, January, February, not exactly peak times in terms of, of home sales. It's really the spring selling season, which is happening right now and going to continue for the next couple of months. So we'll see what they have to say. And it's really, again, back to the margin side of things. If they can sell more homes than the street expects and they don't have to cut price and they don't have to offer incentives, that's really where you could get some 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 upside in terms of earnings. You know, from our perspective, yes, Lenar has been an exceptional performer. I would note Pulte Homes and Toll Brothers, which we also like a little bit better than Lenar, slightly different strategy, have actually outperformed over the past year. That's really where we think mm-hmm. investors should be. From a broader perspective, though, we're very bullish on home builders. We have been bullish on home builders for the better part of a year and a half. I do think the sector has a lot of tailwinds behind it. So mm-hmm. I would expect these stocks generally to move higher. Just think there's some different opportunities that, that are out there in different companies. All right, Tyler, thanks a lot. Super appreciated Tyler Batori over at Oppenheimer. And what's interesting is that this is the first home builder to report that is going to then also take into account mortgage rates going with a six handle to a seven handle, which is what we saw in February, and like what they noticed in terms of the correlation between sales. Yeah, I'm I'm curious about this strategy, and then you have to put that, I guess, the backdrop of valuation of stock that's up 10% to start the year, and that's coming off, what, a 60-plus percent gain uh, that we had last year. I I do want to just turn our attention real quickly away from home builders to WW. Uh, This is, uh, you know, Weight Watchers, Mm -hmm, the former mm -hmm. Weight Watchers. Uh, The shares actually dropped about 12% in less than 15 minutes. No real news right now on the wire, but something to keep an eye on. Uh, They were as down as much as 16%. Now, now down about 11. Uh, there are some third-party reports out there that Bloomberg will uh, try to get a handle on here, but one of the stocks to keep an eye on. We'll be back in a moment. This is Bloomberg. Just about 3.30 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. I know we can make, you know, big hay about some tech names being down or like Tesla getting hurt again. But, you know, it's the real economy stuff that's outperforming today. I mean, energy is up, best performing sector in the S&P. Freeport is the best performing stock within the S&P. That's a real demand underlying fundamental story. Yeah. Does this mean like what? The economy is back? Maybe. I don't know. I I say maybe because I don't know if there's a a line between the commodities and uh, global growth in the way that there has been, say, 30 years ago. But, like, this is the real economy that's doing well. But it gives you kind of real-time sentiment. We always talk about Mm -hmm. stocks being that forward pricing mechanism. But when you look at spot prices, even future prices in the commodity space, that seems to be much more reflective of the here and now. Yeah, so let's get to it. Yeah. Uh, Copper rallying, as we were just saying, to the highest level since last April. So this is the why. you got major Chinese smelters have pledged to discuss potential production cuts to counter some cutthroat competition on the market. So basically, uh, you have miners pay refiners to refine their metals, and that price has been falling. So refiners are getting really squeezed, and they're trying to figure out what to do about it. So for more, we want to bring in Natasha Kaneva, head of global commodity strategy over at J.P. Morgan. Just start with copper for a second. Do you get the read that that's a strong demand pull, why refiners have been working overtime, or is that just tighter mining production, uh, and that's sort of driving down that price? Well, I think it's a combination of both. So on the one side, you definitely have a very resilient global economy. You're absolutely correct the way you described it. It's not just resilient, but the growth is broadening out, yes. 
Previously, it was just the service sectors that was driving the recovery in 2023, and it was U.S.-centric. Right now, we, we have a confirmation for three consecutive months that the PMI is actually recovering, and this recovery is broadening out from the services to the real economy, as you pointed out. This is manufacturing, this is industrial production. Not only that, we have signs that it's not just U.S.-driven. Europe is recovering as well, and China actually is stable to slightly improving. So demand is actually very good across every single commodity under our coverage. But where you're correct, Alex, is that supply is underperforming as well. We had two very significant mine issues in December. It's the Cobra Panama in Panama. And then we had Anglo American downgrading their copper supply numbers out of Chile. And today, of course, we have the news with the Chinese smelters getting together and saying, as you pointed out, wait, we're not making enough money. Maybe we should start cutting production. It's, it's about 300,000 metric tons of that. It's, it's substantial. And if it starts piling up, that definitely makes a difference. So big rally today, our target is $10,000, not in 2024, it's somewhere early 2025, but definitely we believe that the fundamentals are strong enough to support those levels. So that's a clear way of saying it's a supply and a demand story, like we're firing on a lot of cylinders with commodities, and if you think about it, if I were to tell you that commodities really outperformed so far this year when we're entering a world of, say, Fed and central bank cuts, I don't know if I would have believed you, and yet here we are. Here we are. So commodities were a very big deflationary story in 2023. So if you look at the U.S. CPI peaked at 9.1 in June 2022, yes? Last year, December, we closed at 3.4. So two-thirds of that deflation in the U.S. headline CPI was driven by commodities. The biggest chunk out of that was oil price. Yes, going from down from $130 to about 75 but you know b big deflation in the food prices as well so this year commodities are not going to be a deflationary force anymore mm. best case scenario it will be neutral mm -hmm. worst case scenario actually they will be inflationary yeah we've already seen some pretty interesting gains and even in the soft commodities let's talk about gold for a second because that's been on a tear as well and that there does seem to have a direct correlation to what we're seeing with the fed and interest rates yes that's uh, so we upgraded gold to a buy in december 2022 that uh, it, it is our number one trade recommendation for two consecutive years our mm -hmm. target is 2300 Monday we hit a record level of 2200 we believe that we can you know 2500 is a possibility because the market tends to get overexcited mm -hmm. for that we need a confirmation from uh, well continued moderation in the inflation and in the jobs numbers as well and the confirmations that Fed indeed is cutting so, but overall, yes, we think there is more to go. All right, let's talk about oil because there have been some interesting moves in that space. I, I don't know, it felt like a while ago we were all, you know, wringing our hands saying oil was going back up to 100 bucks and then it just kind of petered out and it's kind of been doing nothing oh, until, until recently. It's well, up 15%. I, I know it's, uh, it's, don't say it's, uh, that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're up 10% on Brent or WTI or whatever it is these days here. But what's driving that? Is that real? Is that, is it, it is on? real. Yes, yeah. it is real. Yeah. So actually, oil is trading today exactly where it's supposed to be. The, the fair value is eighty-three dollars in March. So it's it's actually doing exactly what it's supposed to do. The demand is good. Okay. Demand is really really good. It's really resilient. People are flying. People are driving. We can absolutely see that demand is very supportive for that. Uh, so to us, I, you know, the target is high eighties by May. We again see a very strong possibility that actually the market will overshoot. We can you know see ninety May May June. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, of course, what happened last weekend in OPEC and surprise announcement from Russia that they're cutting production. The mm -hmm. market seems to be doubting then our view is that actually it's credible that they indeed they want to see their production declining to nine million barrels per day by June. What would a breakout look like and what would be a trigger for that? Um, so it, it would be similarly to what happened in September or August, September of last year, it would be inventories. So the market will wake up one day and the inventories are drawing down and everybody will start saying the market is very tight and then you'll Is the break up like t 90? Like is it 10 dollars higher. It's always mm. 73, 83, 83, 93. So it's, it's usually moves in 10 dollars increments. All right, uh, Natasha, always great to talk to you. Natasha Kaneva. Thanks for having me. A wealth of knowledge heads uh, the, the global uh, commodities team over there at JP Morgan. And we want, do want to stay in the commodity space, but turn back to equities because one of the big stock movers today is U.S. Steel. Those shares down uh, more than 12% here on the day. And a lot of this has to do, of course, with, uh, I guess, that proposed uh, tie up with Nippon Steel. And now uh, Bloomberg reporting that President Joe Biden here in the United States is expected to release a, quote, statement of concern uh, to the Japanese government here basically expressing uh, U.S. objections to this deal, a statement of concern, while not necessarily binding. 
would have best effectively put the kibosh on this. Uh, yeah, and um, it's up for review anyway for CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. Um, they want to kill the deal over national security concerns, but the difference is Japan is a close ally versus if this was a Chinese company, you would have bet that would never even have happened. It would have been shot dead right away. But, yeah. uh, you know, Japan's supposed to be an ally, so that's actually quite interesting. Yeah, but this gets to the whole issue now. I mean, nobody really wants to do cross-border deals. No country really wants to allow these cross-border deals, even if it is from an ally. Everybody is just all about protecting your own uh, universe here at, at any and all costs. But I think the other issue is is uh, is if prices in the U.S. are going to be uh, are going to fall in relation to global steel prices, right? Because getting a global steel price is impossible. It's like totally factioned all over yeah. the world. And if you don't get a good enough price here, then you just can't stay in business. So no. Then it, it defeats the purpose, right? No. Like you need money from somewhere to stay yep. in business when prices are low and you need them to stay in business so you can build your own supply chain. So you yeah. can't have both. One plus one does actually equal two. Yeah. There's a reason why when you drive through the Midwest and Chicago and all those old steel plants are now not steel plants anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We, you need yeah. the price. You need the price. All right. Uh, maybe trouble for the steel industry, but trouble for TikTok as well. That's our next topic here on The Big Show. The House of Representatives down in Washington passing a bill that would actually ban TikTok in the U.S. unless its China-backed owners sell the short-form video app. It's still got to make its way through the Senate, but the president is on board with that ban. We're going to have the latest for you after the break on The Close on Bloomberg. That's the responsibility of Congress. That's our responsibility to guard against these kind of national security issues. That's why we acted on this. We're not talking about banning TikTok. This is up to TikTok. This is up to ByteDance. They make the decision on whether they want it to go away or whether they want to divest themselves of the ownership of this. Representative Buddy Carter, a Republican, Republican from Georgia, speaking a little bit earlier here about that bill in the House of Representatives, a bill that did pass and would ban TikTok in the U.S. unless ByteDance, the Chinese owner, sells the social media app. Here with the latest from Washington is Bloomberg National Security reporter Daniel Flatley. Uh, Dan, uh, let's first start off with the next procedure here. This has to get, make it through the Senate, but we've already heard from the president, and or at least his spokesperson, who has made it clear that he supports this ban. How much support is there for this ban in the Senate right now? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question, Romaine. I mean, I think that there is, if you polled the Senate, you'd probably find majority support for, for something like this, no question. Um, but the Senate is, is kind of a, an interesting body. It's smaller than the House, obviously, and, and each senator has more power. So um, you have committee uh, chairs who are looking to sort of put their stamp on this, maybe looking to take things in a slightly different direction. I mean, if you look at what um, Karine Jean-Pierre said in response to questions about whether the president would support this, she said that she was happy that it passed the House, that they look forward to it passing the Senate. But she did say uh, a, a crucial phrase, which is technical assistance. She said the White House would offer technical assistance. Mm. And she said that they want to put this... Um, this bill on a, a solid legal footing, which has kind of been their, their standard line, but it seems to indicate that there may be some changes that they might look to make as it, as it moves through the Senate. And that could mm -hmm. complicate things depending on what happens there. Dan, also my question is that if, if by, and lots of ifs, if by dance was like, fine, we'll sell whatever portion of TikTok or whatever version, whatever that is, the question is then who would buy it, right? It looks like it would have to be kind of the metas of the world, which in which case those social media sites would get bigger. Would the administration be okay with that? Yeah, you know, this has been a major topic of conversation in the hallways on Capitol Hill today and yesterday. Who would buy uh, TikTok? Um, as you mentioned, Meta is already uh, a huge social media giant. Uh, the Biden administration has looked at a lot of big tech companies um, with a, sort of a, a wary eye on antitrust grounds. Um, they're working. Uh, there's a few cases uh, pending against some, some of these companies uh, on antitrust concerns. So, you know, the question is, who would buy TikTok? It's very expensive. It's more valuable now than it was uh, a few years ago when Trump tried to ban it when, when, when he was in office. Um, and I think that, you know, the other question is, is six months, is, the, is that enough time to really bring about a sale like this 
Uh, it's, it's, you know, that's one of the concerns that a lot of the bill's opponents in the House cited, not just the fact that this came to the floor so quickly, but that it doesn't really or may not give ByteDance enough time to find a buyer. And we should point out ByteDance has already responded to this, or rather I should say TikTok, basically saying they plan to lobby the Senate uh, on this issue. And at least for right now, they're making no changes right now to their business practices. From a national security perspective, Dan, I, I mean, I get the hype around this, but is there really substance to the perceived threat of this data collection? Data collection, we should point out, pretty much every social media platform and tech company for that matter does right here in the U.S. Yeah, I think, you know, that's a great point, Romain. You know, um, a lot of folks who are, again, opponents of this bill say they have concerns about data security, but that this bill does not address those concerns because, as you point out, uh, a lot of these uh, social media companies will sell data uh, or, or collect it in other ways. I think that what really has given lawmakers a, a very strong argument here is the connection between ByteDance and, and the Chinese government. And, and there is a law on the books uh, that, you know, that China could ask companies within its remit to, to turn over data. And I think the real question with that is, mm -hmm. uh, is, is not just the, the richness of the data and the algorithm and the kind of data that it collects, but also could that be married up with some other data that China has collected to, yeah. to, um, to you know, for, for risks there. Hey, Dan, thanks a lot. Super appreciate it. Bloomberg's Dan Flatley uh, joining us there on Tic Tac. A Tic Tac? Tic Tac, sure. That's Tic Tac's cousin. Why not? Coming up, Ellen Lee, Portfolio Manager over at Causeway Capital Management, will be joining us right as we head into the close. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. It looks like uh, some of the big gains that we had earlier today, that's kind of faded here. The Russell bit, yeah. really holding in the green, but only fractionally on the day. The rest of the market in the red. Yeah, NASDAQ 100 around yeah. the lows of the session, down 7 tenths uh, of 1%. But here's a stat for you. Ready? S&P has gone 265 sessions, now 266, without a drop of at least 2%. We okay. haven't seen that since 2018. Yeah. This well, is like day by day, you'll like pick away at my resistance to the yeah. to the bullishness. But that's also a good thing, right? I mean, do you really want to see 2% moves, whether it's up or down, those types of extreme moves that we had gotten used to? I mean, sometimes, you know, a uh, half a percent up one day and, you know, a quarter of a percent down the next, maybe that's a sign of a healthy market. Maybe. And again, like yeah. I like the rotation. You get the yeah. materials, you get energy, industrials, the Russell, like those feels to me, they yeah. feel to me like better signs. And that's the big question right now. A lot of people are saying that there is a rotation afoot. You see that with big tech stocks sliding today and small caps are outperforming. We had a chance to catch up with Jason Trenner at Strategus a little bit earlier about the shift in investor sentiment. This economy certainly seems among to be the strongest uh, in the world. And so I think people have a little bit more confidence uh, in some ways just moving away from things that uh, they know will provide them growth uh, that uh, regardless, uh, which is tech. And now they're, they're focusing on things that are a little bit more cyclical and a little more dependent upon uh, a continuation of the business cycle. And that was Jason Trenard, who joined us at the top of the hour to kick us off to those closing bells. Here to help take us to the bell is Ellen Lee, Portfolio Manager at Causeway Capital Management. And Ellen, the big question right now isn't so much as whether there are cheap stocks out there. There are. But is the value enticing enough to continue this rotation? I think, you know, at this point of the market, what really is important is to see companies execute and it really is dependent upon if companies are delivering what they're promising. And across the whole valuation spectrum, I think if the company is able to execute, regardless of where you are in the multiple valuation spectrum, I think the market will reward that. And hopefully the expectations and the value stocks will be lower mm -hmm. than what people expect. However, even if you are at those multiples, if you don't meet your expectations, I think the market is going to be uh, yeah. very ju judgy on you know how the stocks will react. So at this point, if you're doing earnings delivery and meeting market expectations, I think you're in a good position. And as you know, you talked about in the previous segment, there is more room in the value names because right. expectations are lower. The expectations are lower, but we've started to see a little bit of a perk up uh, in that uh, earnings growth and revenue growth for the small and mid cap names. That's certainly been evident this earnings cycle to a certain extent, Ellen, in certain pockets of that small cap space. They've actually done a little bit better than some of those large cap companies. 
Yes, I think it's a combination of the fact that the economy, U.S. economy, is doing well. And unless there is any event for us to think that the economy doesn't have legs, I think that should continue. Um, do we need a Fed rate cut for that to for it to also continue, or is it more important that the economy is good and we don't get the cut? I mean, obviously, there's that's the I guess the trillion dollar question. But the reality is, I think the market's also recognizing, even at these rate levels, the market's doing okay. The real economy is doing okay. So I don't think there is an expectation of a huge rate cut that needs to be precipitated. And things are chugging along. They, that, that's what's so amazing. It's like we're chugging along, which pushes back the rate cut. But again, the economy seems to be able uh, to handle it. So. What's going to be my next catalyst? We're through earnings. We're through that narrative. It's going to be hard to disrupt that narrative. What now do you trade off of? I mean, for us at Causeway, we're really looking at company fundamentals and earnings delivery and looking at companies that can deliver earnings irrespective of the operating environment or have managed communication to a level where, you know, their expectations are manageable. So at the end of the day, we are looking for companies to just chug along. Okay. Are there any specific names that excite you right now? Well, there's a name in the UK, Reckitt and Kieser. Mm -hmm. It's basically the maker of Lysol. They gone through, obviously, the COVID um, ups and downs with Lysol, but also they were beneficiaries of product recall of Avid infant formula in the US. And there seems to be less visibility because of these you know, uh, peaks and valleys they had to go through. But long term, we think there is good value. Mm -hmm. The It's a consumer staples company trading at a multiple that's akin to GFC levels. So we think there's really good value there and they've continued to do share buybacks. So yeah. think within the control the company is, is is dictating. Well, what about in the discretionary space? I mean, there's been so much talk about consumer spending, whether that's going to hold up. Do you find some confidence to wade into those waters? Well, some uh, one consumer discretionary name we like is Caring, the maker of Gucci. Obviously, you know, Caring, a luxury goods company, you know, operating in China, that has really brought valuation down. But now with the new creative director there, we feel product refreshed will really ignite sales. And what's also interesting, Romain, that I would point out is, you know, consumer sentiment or consumer confidence are very bifurcated depending on uh, your income levels. Today we saw, you know, I think Dollar Tree announced that the lower income customers are struggling. But if you look at the sales of luxury goods, actually the middle to higher income consumers are doing well as real wage growth is really there. It's interesting though, you, p you picked two companies that are not U.S. companies. And I wonder if that says anything about valuation for the S&P versus European companies. Oh, well, thank you for pointing it out. It just seems, you know, U.S. market is a little bit frothier, you know, in my view. And if you actually look at the numbers, I understand U.S. markets should trade at a premium to international, but the level is really, really high. Of course, you has, U.S. market has more tech, so some of that is justified. But we do see more value in international. And if you think about the appetite for stocks in Europe with onshoring and reshoring in Europe and all the infrastructure investment that will happen with energy transition. I think Europe is in a better place than before. And, you know, I don't want to say it's different this time around, but yeah. I do. There's a little bit of tailwinds that didn't exist before. All right, Ellen, going to have to leave it there. Ellen Lee, portfolio manager at Causeway Capital Management, helping us count down uh, to the close here on this uh, Wednesday afternoon. Uh, we only have about two and a half minutes until we get to those bells here. A little bit more of that seesaw that we've seen really over the past few weeks now, right, where we get a, a decent rally and then you kind of get that little you bit of trickle of a, of a fade. Uh, I don't know. Does this bounce back tomorrow? I don't know. You tell me. Uh, you tell me. No, I just you tell me. You. No, but I mean, I'm asking you second. I'm no, the, you ask me first. I um, ask you second. Th I mean, could, would it bounce back from what? Yeah. I mean, you could definitely continue to see the rotation into small caps. Yeah. You have retail sales though tomorrow, so that could be a decider potentially for that. Yeah, I think the retail sales numbers maybe gives us a little bit more insight into just whether those economic conditions are going to hold up. Our full coverage right now of all the market action today as we take you to the Bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. 
And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. We're counting you down to the closing bell. Here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast. Scarlett Fu in the TV studio. Carol Masser and Tim Stenevik in the radio booth as we welcome all of our audiences across we all call it the fish of our ball. Bloomberg. The what? <laughs> the fish ball. Is it? Is it it's okay. Kind of. all right. uh, because we're all fish, we have so no memory. What does that mean? I should <laughs> just come by and sprinkle <laughs> it one out. Because you're on display like when you, you walk by the radio studio. That's why. <laughs> or it's like where the monkeys are. Feed the monkeys. <laughs> All right, I digress. I don't know where to go from there. I'm yeah, just happy either. it's Wednesday. <laughs> like, okay. um, I'm going to yeah. talk about the uh, copper space. Copper stocks are up. There's no segue there. Copper stocks are up. Uh, the base metal climbing. Uh, this on the potential for capacity cuts at Chinese smelters, if you will. So if you look at the Global X Copper Miners ETF, folks, it is up more than 7%. And I'll have some more names uh, when I hit, get to my gainers later on. So yeah. Another day, another, another day. record for Bitcoin. Yeah. Fourth time in six days it's reached a record. Uh, we are seeing a lot of inflows into the ETFs. BlackRock saw a record $849 million in inflows just on Tuesday. Bitcoin up about 70% so far this year. I'm looking at the re-rating or what seems to be a re-rating of Tesla. It's the worst performer among the Magnificent Seven. And for that group over the past year, it's the only member to decline. Everyone else has gained, but Tesla's down 3%. Uh, Wells Fargo saying it's a growth stock with, without growth. Uh, it sees zero growth in sales volume this year. I asked earlier, can it be a growth stock if there is no growth? That was a harsh. answer from yeah. Wells Fargo's now. Sorry. That was definitely a harsh uh, <laughs> note from Wells Fargo, uh, for sure. But, but clearly, market holding up okay despite the Tesla rolling over the last couple weeks. Yeah, interesting market, though. You look at all the names that are moving higher here, you're not going to really find any real tech names out there. I think PayPal is the only one, and that's kind of tech-ish, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is going to manage to squeak into the green on the day, up about a tenth of a percent, though it had been significantly higher earlier in the session. The S&P 500 closing in the red, down by about 10 points or two tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq down 88 points or five tenths of a percent, while the Russell 2000, which at one point was up as much as seven tenths of a percent, giving back some of those gains, but closing out in the green up six points or three tenths of a percent. All right, staying with the S&P 500, for a moment, folks. Uh, 265 names to the downside. Scarlet, 236 uh, losing ground in the Wednesday trade and two unchanged. All right, let's look at the sector performances here. You've got energy, the clear outperformer, up one and a half percent. The pie overall is a real mix there, though, because you have technology down more than one percent, and that's Tesla, really, the drag there. Real estate investment trusts uh, off by six tenths of one percent. Healthcare um, losing a little bit of ground there, but uh, the strength is in those commodity names, energy materials as well as utilities. All right, guys, let's get to some of the individual gainers, if I may. Uh, number one, gainer in the S&P 500. I talked about the copper stocks um, rising in today's session, some of the miners. So Freeport, Mac Moran, it is the number one gainer in the S&P 500. A gain uh, just off its highs of the day, but still with a gain of about 7.6%. We mentioned the potential capacity cuts at Chinese smelters, so that gave a lift, if you will, to the overall space. Uh, let's go to what was a top gainer among the NDX, the NASDAQ 100. Uh, and we're talking about PDD. Um, this uh, gaining, what is it, about 3.5%. It was up as much as 8% earlier in the session, but finishing the day with a gain of about 3.6%. Company hiring Aaron Webster from SoFi Technologies to help the payments. Uh, oh, forgive me. I'm sorry. I jumped ahead. Yeah, there it is, PDD. Um, that was PayPal. Let me just move ahead. Sorry, lost my place. Pay, um, P, where are we? PDD. Yes. You got this. No real market moving news, but it was higher in today's session, up about 3.6%. It is the parent company of Temu, the upstart discounter founded in China. We know that it's continuing to make its way in the U.S. market. Uh, rallying for a third straight day, folks, it's up about 13% or so uh, in the past three days. Uh, it is going to report its earnings on March 20th. And now to the other P company that I was going to report on, and that's PayPal. Uh, this one was a top gainer in the NASDAQ 100, so forgive me for kind of messing it up. Uh, up about 4% in today's session, it hired Aaron Webster from SoFi Technologies to help uh, the company fight financial crime and fraud. He's joining as Chief Enterprise Services Officer. That's effective March 18th. Um, and so he's going to help oversee their global financial crime and fraud prevention programs and maintain regulatory and government relations. So that was kind of the only real news, but those were some of the outperformers in today's session. Okay, I got some underperformers. You heard a little preview from Scarlett earlier about shares of Tesla uh, down more than 4% on the day today. 4.53 percent to the downside. This after Wells Fargo came out and said that there will be zero growth in sales volumes this year. Next year, sales volumes are actually going to 
drop. Remember, many people do consider this a growth company, so surprising to see this call and it affecting the company's stock price. Also affecting the company's stock price uh, is what President Biden may come out and say. He hasn't said it yet, but according to those uh, familiar uh, with uh, the statement, President Biden is expected to soon release a statement of concern about Nippon Steel's proposed takeover of, of U.S. Steel, ticker X. Bloomberg did report this, citing people familiar with the matter. Shares closed down by close to 13 percent. We don't know the scope of Biden's statement, how far he'll go. Um, the, the people who asked not to be named because the information is private told Bloomberg the White House declined to comment, Nippon Steel declined to comment, and U.S. Steel did not respond to requests for comment. Uh, and then I do want to check in on shares of uh, Dollar Tree today. Uh, the company uh, having its worst day in years after it came out this morning and said it was going to close a thousand stores across the country. Shares off falling today by more than 14 percent, Alex. Man, dollar stores, really rough yeah. go. Okay, I'm looking at the bond market here. Sell off across the curve uh, yet again. So you've now seen 10 year yields rise. Uh, for about three straight days. It's sitting like right on its 200 day moving average, guys, and I care because then we're kind of like a stone's throw away from the 100 day moving average. So we're just breaking some resistance here on the upside when it comes to yields, and that could be kind of a motivator. So definitely watching that into retail sales tomorrow. Yeah, I could see some big moves in yields, uh, particularly heading into next week as well. I do want to go back to some of the individual movers on the day, and you were just talking about uh, Dollar Tree uh, there, uh, Tim, just a second ago, because I thought it was kind of a tale of two cities. Remember, yeah. we got earnings out of Williams Sonoma. That was one of the best uh, stock performers today, at least on a percentage basis. That closed at a record high. But, and Dollar Tree, one of the worst performers. But what I thought was interesting about Dollar Tree was Apparently, they're not really a dollar store anymore, $7 Alex. You're, you're store lamenting now. that. Just, but they moved away from that a long time ago. Yeah. Remember, they had this range of about like three to five bucks. With, that was kind of the top end range kind of for year a lot so, of right? prices. Yeah. And now they're coming out and they're saying, basically saying, we need higher income consumers. And as a result, they need to broaden their offerings. So now dollar store is $7 store. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the same sort of, it doesn't right, quite roll off the tongue, $7 tree, the way Dollar Tree does. But, yeah. you know, for years. Mind. Well, you know, five and dimes it. used to be popular too, Tim. That's true. Yeah. 21 below, now, now right? Wasn't 21 below? Like, everything was under $21. Yeah. Motel 6? Oh, no, five below. Was it five 21? Below. It was five below. Five okay. below, See, yeah. Wow, you're, you're huh? definitely living Park Slope, dude. <laughs> what about, <laughs> <laughs> well, it, what that? about Motel 6? How's that? <laughs> wow. That was $6 a night. That's what it was. Well, the reason that they are apparently expanding in terms of some of the items in their costing a little bit more, they're no longer just a, a dollar or just a few dollars, is apparently the consumers that are shopping at Dollar Tree are kind of more upscale. They said that their new customers, uh, they're gaining higher income consumers. It's new customers in 2023 were mostly households earning more than $125,000 a year. So they're kind of looking to broaden out their offerings. Let's face it, Dollar Tree, these discount retailers really depended on cheap imports from China. And if that's going to drop off and consumers can get their cheap goods from China directly through Timor or Alibaba, they mm. don't necessarily That's need to really go to Dollar point. Tree. And so what is left perhaps is not made in some of those lower cost countries. Okay, but you definitely have to then upscale the inventory and the product offerings and just and just the stores. I mean, have you guys been to some stores? I mean, it is really, really, really tough going for some of these dollar stores. Uh, and the people there look absolutely miserable to work there. I'm just saying you need to like revamp a lot more than just here. The seven experience bucks for this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, we've, we've reported Remains a lot about that. Been on the I, mean, they, I, been I, right. I don't think anyone disagrees with you, but I think that takes, you know, But they're saying, they're saying vision, the higher end shopper money, is money. going there. So you that's know. kind of interesting. Are you going there, Carol? Um, I've gone in the past for like kids' birthday parties. Well, like I was going to say kids' think, birthday parties. <laughs> huge. I do, right? I do think like it also depends on, it depends on where you live because in some communities around the country, yeah. the these sorts store. of stores are the only stores that are around now and they've they've catered to to that to start selling different types of things so it's mm -hmm. not just like you know what you'd get at traditionally at a dollar store but they have food items at some of these too yeah uh dollar food or well, seven dollar food now yeah. uh, guys or the other big story below. of the day of course uh, had to do with that uh TikTok bill mm -hmm. in the house of representatives i know you've been keeping an eye on that i don't know if this is going to pass the house but uh, i mean excuse me the senate but the president's already said if it does he's going to sign it you know it, it's amazing what congress can do when it puts its mind to something <laughs> <laughs> i'm kind quick, of impressed it's been like a year and yeah. counting though they can get right. stuff done they can pass bills who knew I've done some informal polling around parents of teenagers. Mm -hmm. Seems like they're they're kind of in favor of this too. Some of those who I've spoken to. I know I'm not going to ask you guys how you feel because you're journalists and I know you you know don't have feelings on this. Uh, but yeah, I've talked to some parents who say, "Can you get this thing off my kid's phone?" I will say our Josh Green reporting uh, that it might be tricky once it gets to the Senate because already senators are tinkering with it in terms of their own version of what should be done. So we'll see whether or not it gets 
ultimately across the finish line and whether or not a ban uh, ultimately happens. But politics or policy, that's another thing I think we should debate at some point in the future. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Our cross-platform coverage, radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals. We call it Beyond the Bell. We'll see you again, same time, same place tomorrow. All right, a lot more coverage coming up here on Bloomberg Television. We are in the early innings right now of the corporate proxy season, but it actually promises to be somewhat contentious. Kai Likafet going to be joining us. He's a partner over at Sidley Austin. They are really the premier firm out there for shareholder activism, defenses, strategies. We're going to get a discussion with him about some of the big activist campaigns this season. That's coming up after the break. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Scarlett Fu with Romaine Bostic. We have the S&P 500 retreating from a record high. And of course, we've got some big data points tomorrow with PPI and of course, retail sales due up. So you have the S&P losing two tenths of 1%. The Magnificent Seven is a big reason why, although uh, not every big tech name declined. The one notable one is Tesla uh, on the back of a bearish analyst note from Wells Fargo saying this is a growth stock without growth. It doesn't see any sales volume growth uh, for the rest of this year. The 10-year yield moves up by almost four basis points. This is after today's 30-year bond auction drew pretty decent demand in contrast to yesterday's lackluster 10-year auction. Again, we have those big data points tomorrow. And Bitcoin, uh, it hit $73,000. Drake, in fact, made clear on Instagram that he's a big crypto bull. Let's take a look at the individual movers here. U.S. Steel uh, declining actually plunging in midday on an FT report that Joe Biden, the president, plans to express serious concern over the plan to be sold to Nippon Steel. Uh, the president will reportedly make a statement on this before the Japanese prime minister visits Washington in April. Uh, we're looking also at Dollar Tree, the worst performer in the S&P 500, on a plan to shut down about a thousand stores to boost its profitability. Within the retail space, Williams-Sonoma, a big gainer here, up 18% after it gave a better-than-expected full-year sales forecast and operating margins in particular, which really got a big thumbs up from analysts. And Carnival Corp, uh, up 2.5%. In fact, Royal Caribbean also gaining after Goldman Sachs initiated coverage of those two names with a buy rating. Uh, Goldman saying the rally in cruise line operators has further room to go and that demand should outpace supply and that should give them plenty of pricing power. Romain? All right, Scarlett. There were more than 800 activist investor campaigns worldwide launched in 2023. That's a 24% jump. This year's tally could actually be higher. The latest proxy season underway now with Starbucks holding its annual shareholders meeting today. That comes amid a rift between the coffee chain and a coalition of labor groups that had sought board seats. Now, while those union groups did withdraw their bids after getting concessions, it did provide a fascinating read on the challenges surrounding effective activist investing. It's also somewhat of a wake-up call, if you will, for corporate America. For more on the trends that he's seen, who better to talk to than Kyle Likafet? He joins us now. He's a partner and co-chair of the shareholder activism and corporate defense practice over at Sidley Austin. Based on Bloomberg data, Sidley Austin now has topped the league tables for two straight years. You guys were advisors on at least something like 48 deals last year. I think 48 in 2022. Uh, Kai, you expect that number to be somewhat similar this year as well? Well, yes, I actually expect that number to even increase. I mean, the uh, the signs that we see is that this proxy season will be even busier than the last one. Uh, uh, last year, as you may recall, the macroeconomic environment wasn't all that good. We had high inflation, we had uh, high interest rates, we had uh, significant disruptions in supply chain through uh, as a result of the, uh, the Russia-Ukraine war and other issues. And we still had almost record levels of activism. This year, the macroeconomic environment is uh, is improving mm -hmm. compared to last year. So it stands to reason that we might see even more activism in 2024. What's going to be the complexion of that? When you sort of look at some of the campaigns that are, and how they've played out, just in maybe in the last, I don't know, eight to 12 months or so, we've seen a little bit more of a focus on M&A. And we've also seen this trend where those activist campaigns didn't actually make it all the way to an actual vote, that basically those issues were settled before it actually got to the annual meeting. Yeah, no, these are all very good observations. Let's start with the last one. 
Yes, uh, companies typically prefer to settle these kind of situations. I've uh, defended 159 proxy fights in the last five years. I have yet to see a client who tells me afterwards, Kai, that was great. Can't <laughs> wait for the next one. It is really tough to go through a proxy fight. So uh, when do activist situations go to a proxy fight? It's typically one of three reasons. Number one, the activist wants to get the CEO fired. Number two, the activist wants to have a principal on the board. And number three, the activist wants a company sword. And uh, these three uh, reasons account for about 90% of the activist situations that go to a vote. Thank you for listing out those three reasons. Um, in the case of Disney, it looks like two of those are up for contention because you have a three-way proxy fight between the company and two activist investors. You've got uh, Tryon and you also have Blackwells. Is that unusual to see it being kind of uh, pulled apart in three ways? That's highly unusual. I've been doing this for 25 years. I have never seen a proxy fight with three parties go to war. And the reason for that is very simple. If you have two activists, it splits the anti-company vote. So it actually hurts the activist. So what normally happens if two activists show up at the same company, there is some back, uh, backroom dealing between the activists and they agree one of them is going to withdraw and the other one goes forward with the fight. This only helps the company. I see. So it's like a third party candidate in an election in a way. Right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the Disney situation, because there is a shareholder vote scheduled in April. Disney, as we know, has a lot of retail shareholders. How does this impact the proxy contest and the way that the different activists are campaigning? Yeah, retail uh, proxy fights are very, very different than uh, proxy fights at companies like Starbucks. Starbucks has over 70% institutional investors. You use different messaging and different tools when you have a company with high retail ownership. Uh, the problem is with retail is they don't always turn out to vote. Hmm. You need to really chase the retail. I mean, just think about yourself. I mean, how often do you uh, take a phone call from a number you don't know? How often do you throw away mail? And uh, that's exactly the challenge in a retail proxy fight, is to try to get the retail investors to actually vote. So you need to use social media, Google Ads, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, Instagram to reach the audience. And then you have the big unknown. Mm. Uh, in the good old days, the, uh, the, the urban legend was, well, retail investors tend to vote for management. Nowadays, that's, not no, that's no longer always true. Uh, sometimes you run into a mob when you start to engage with, uh, with retail over social media. Yeah. So you need to be really careful as a company. Uh, well, it's kind of interesting. I, I, it's interesting you bring that up, too, because when you look at some of the uh, recent campaigns, even the ones that aren't necessarily led particularly by retail, some of those investors are clearly have those retail investors at their back. We've been talking a lot about uh, whatever the heck is going on with Macy's and Arc House and a few of these companies kind of kicking the tires there. Uh, you, I, I believe you, or at least I'd Sidley Austin, was certainly involved to some degree with Nordstrom and Ryan Cohen came looking for a board seat there. Like, what's the conversation like when you get that? And maybe there's this sense that, OK, is this guy serious? Are they do they even have the money? Should we engage them at all? What does that conversation look like? Well, just generally speaking, when you receive a nomination of uh, director candidates from a dissident, you need to take it seriously. Uh, it is not that easy to do that because as a legal matter, you need to uh, prepare significant and complex paperwork to uh, submit nominations. So if and when a dissident succeeds in uh, providing you with, uh, with proper paperwork, they have already spent significant amounts of money and time to do that. At that point, you have no choice but to take it seriously as a company. Yeah. And, and this gets us to uh, the question, too, that when we talk about what activists look for, meaning why they're picking specific companies, obviously it isn't just about, OK, we think this is undervalued. We think it's uh, undermanaged and we can sort of bring some life to that here. It, do they also take into account the potential malleability of the board or the malleability of management? Well, absolutely. Look, at the end of the day, activists uh, 
want only the best. They want your money, right? They want to be able to send their kids to private school. And how do they do that? By finding companies they believe are underperforming and then seeing a path to changing that underperformance and increasing the share price. And if they identify a company that has a board that is, let's say, less uh, inclined to fight, that is certainly a criteria activists are looking at. Kai, you're such an expert on all of this. I wonder if you could maybe even generalize a little bit here in, in talking about the different generations of activist investors. There is the old school guys like uh, Carl Icahn or Nelson Peltz. And then, of course, you've got the younger generation like Ryan Cohen and then folks who might be in between like Bill Ackman. What sets them apart? What 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 are their strategies that really define them? Yeah, there's really a generational change uh, right now undergoing in uh, in corporate America. Carl Icahn, bless his heart, uh, but I I doubt he's going to do this for another 10 years, although he's been good for business, so keep it up, Carl. <laughs> uh, Nelson Peltz is also uh, no spring chicken anymore. And uh, so we're looking at the next generation. Uh, the next generation at Elliott, at Starboard, is very strong. They are very active. And then we have a new generation coming, um, funds that are just uh, starting oftentimes uh, by, uh, by former principals of one of the big funds. And uh, they're very different, these campaigns. When you deal with someone like Carl Icahn, Starboard or Elliot, you know what they want. They, you know how they go about it. You know their playbook. If you uh, deal with one of the new activists, you might deal with an ankle biter who has actually no interest in a quick settlement. They want to be on Bloomberg TV first for a couple of weeks before they agree to an amicable resolution because for them, campaigning is fundraising. Oh, interesting. Okay, that's a really good way of looking at it. Kai, really appreciate your uh, joining us and sharing your expertise. Kai Likafed is partner at Sidley Austin. Um, that was fascinating, the, this idea of, I mean, Ryan Cohen, come on, on to Bloomberg Television and tell us what you want to do with your various campaigns before you actually move forward with any of them. Yeah, I mean, they certainly know how to use the media, and, yeah. I mean, and they've had some success with that, obviously, but every now and then they do sort of meet their match, or if you're Carl Icahn, you never admit you met your match, you just keep <laughs> fighting and fighting until, yes. the, until the battle until the never ends. Last day. So, uh, I, lo I mean, you've seen that Carl Icahn documentary, I mean, it's so illuminating yeah. into just the fights that he's picked and why he's actually been successful in a lot of them. He's, yeah. the, he's quite the character. Yeah. All right. Well, well, speaking of quite the characters, coming up, we've got the top three, where we focus in on the top three movers and shakers at the center of the day's biggest stories. This is The Close on Bloomberg. It's time now for the top three, where we take a deep dive into the people driving the day's most talked about stories. And first up is Jamie Dimon. It turns out that J.P. Morgan CEO is on Team Iger. According to CNBC, Dimon is backing Bob Iger in the Disney Chiefs proxy battle with Nelson Peltz. He's yeah. chosen a side. Yeah, he's chosen a side. And I mean, why not? Who else are you going to back? I mean, who else they got? I mean, this has been the whole issue with uh, with uh, uh, Disney overall and their leadership. Uh, and it's funny that this comes out. This was actually the day way back, if you remember, back in the early 2000s when Michael Eisner was forced out and they mm -hmm. basically named uh, Bob Iger uh, to be his replacement. And remember, he was a golden boy, you know, he came from Cap City, yeah. uh, which you know, worked with Dave, our very own David Weston and then rose to be CEO, left as CEO and now rose back to BC. And everyone's yeah. wondering, where's the succession plan? Yeah, and Jay well, Jamie Dimon has definitely backed his horse here. Uh, interesting, though, you talk about succession plans. You have another company out there, Petco, doesn't really have a succession plan, but what they do have is, well, not a new CEO. Ron Coughlin, who's been leading that company since 2018, forced out here, and Michael Mohan stepping in now as interim Ooh, CEO. Yeah. They have to find a replacement for him. But we should point out, Ron Coughlin, when he just came in, there was a lot of high expectations. Shares did well for a while, but since 2021, down 64%. And of course, the bigger problem yeah. is the overall slowdown in the pet retailing space. The pet pandemic boom really helped companies like Petco for a while before uh, now when everyone seems to be giving up their pets, or at least they're cutting back giving on up spending. Their pets? Yeah, pets. a lot of pets are being given up. They're going back to the shelters. Oh, Heartless awful. people. That's awful. Yeah.
Okay, Scarlett. Heartless, heartless. Uh, not me. Lighten My dog is still us. with us. All right, the final person we're watching is Don Lemon. The former CNN host was supposed to launch a new show <laughs> on the X platform, but Elon Musk abruptly canceled it. That's according to a post from Lemon. He says the decision came hours after he conducted an interview with Elon Musk for the show. Wait, wait, what? what? Yes. He so, interviewed Elon Musk for this show that he was going to put on X. Yeah. Elon Musk did the interview. Don Lemon said he thought it was a good conversation. Apparently, Elon Musk didn't think so because after that, he, uh, Don Lemon was told, you know what, this is no longer exclusive on X. Okay, so two things. A, I, I did not know Don Lemon even had a show mm -hmm. on X. Uh, B, I've Where interviewed, former TV I've interviewed hundreds of people, maybe thousands. And while some of those interviews have not gone well, I've never actually been fired after one, which is, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, now I, mean, I can't wait to watch this interview. Yeah, that's interesting. It's yeah. going to be available on other platforms, so we You're can You're going to watch decide. this? Well, I kind of want to know what happened. Okay. Don't you? No, I don't. <laughs> All right, coming up here on the big program, we're going to take a closer look at the state of retail. Stick around, a big conversation coming up next, right here on Bloomberg. Shares of Macy's this week climbed to a one-year high. The department store chain has announced plans to close 150 stores as part of a massive overhaul as it tries to fight off a pair of activist investors. Let's bring in an authoritative voice on this ongoing story, Alan Ellinger. He is founder and senior managing partner of MMG Advisors, and Alan is here with us in studio. Alan, good to see you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So the new CEO, uh, Tony Spring's strategy is to close stores and to double down on the remaining stores, increasing merchandise at those remaining stores. Is this prescription aggressive enough? Uh, I think it is. Um, I think Tony's on the right path. Um, clearly, there have been too many stores. When you, when you look at department store chains, there are A, B, C, and D level department right. stores. Um, the, the C and D stores are drag on earnings. Um, the vendor community has to subsidize the inventory in those stores with markdown allowances. Um, is Macy's A or B? No, actually, Macy's has A, B, C, and D stores there you in go. their branches. Sorry, okay. I have to be a little clearer. My apologies. So what, what Tony's apparently doing is cleaning up the, the D and C stores, trying mm -hmm. to get rid of the smaller, unproductive units. Um, I think he's probably... Um, the stores that he's closing represent 10% of their sales, but about 25% of their square footage. Mm -hmm. So what he's trying to do is make the remaining square footage a lot more productive and hopefully use that um, revenue to increase customer service, reduce the amount of SKUs that, that, that are offered in the stores right now because the stores are over inventoried. Right. You can't possibly go through that amount of inventory in a season, and that's what creates all these markdowns and sales at the end of the season. Okay, so be more curated um, and deliver a better experience for the customer. There was an Axios report this week, Alan, that uh, Macy's may directly negotiate a sale to the activist firms, uh, actually Arkhouse in particular, without launching a strategic review. What would a strategic review possibly reveal? Possibly the options that Macy's has. That, that's what a strategic review is intended to do. Mm -hmm. So why would it, Macy's want to do it this way? I can't answer that question. I really don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's giving a negotiation possibly. Only the really senior management team would know why they're approaching it that way and the board. So I, I don't have insight into that. But typically uh, a, a target like that would want to undertake a strategic review, understand what their options are, and also understand what the value of the business is from their perspective, yeah. not, from a, not from somebody offering a price. Okay, and so. of course, real estate is at the center of this 34th particular Street deal. 34th Street and 6th Avenue, right? Right, right. Let's say Macy's does sell their assets, their real estate assets. What happens next? How do you value the rest of that operation as it it'll, currently stands? Typically, it'll be based on a, on a multiple of its earnings, which is typically how you value a business. Once you peel away the real estate, yeah. um, you have to see what, what you, then you'd have to impute what the rent would be on the real estate you're now renting, so it changes the formula, right? Absolutely. In a case like Macy's, or I'm thinking of other companies as well, sometimes a company just needs to get smaller, right? It needs yes. to reduce its square footage. It means the financials will worsen as a result before it can regain its footing and, and you know, change the trajectory. Can you do that as a public company, or is the only option really to be taken private? I think that as long as the company announces its intentions, and that it's playing a longer game than mm -hmm. it would normally play, I think the market would respect that. But then it all lies in the communication and whether you have the right leadership Absolutely. For that. And I think the, the, the current, you've got a guy that running the business that comes from a smaller operation, a curated operation. Mm -hmm. um, so I think he's got the experience mm -hmm. um, to do what has to be done here to turn this thing around. Look, Macy's is the dominant mid-tier retailer across America. It's, it's a national brand, right? Uh, it's got a Thanksgiving Day parade. It's got 4th, 4th of July. It's, it's known nationally. 
Um, so it's a store that deserves to be fixed, and I believe it can be. You know, we got some headlines here on Under Armour. I'm just going to read it out loud here. Under Armour has named Kevin Plank the CEO. Um, of okay. course, he was the founder. Again? <laughs> yes, he was the founder of Under Armour. Yes. He left. Uh, someone else was named. He's now come back. What does that signal to someone like you? Um, they, need, they need help. Um, Why is it better to bring the founder back? He understands the DNA of that company better than anybody else does. He was a builder. Um, he, he's, he founded it. Um, and I think they, he, bought, he probably... Why does Steve Jobs come back and, and turn around Apple? Right? They need the magic formula again. Right. Alan, really appreciate your joining us today. Thanks Alan for Ellinger me. is founder and senior managing partner of MMG Advisors. We should note that Alan is in town for the 2024 American Image Awards. So too is Steve Lamar, who is president and CEO of the American Apparel and Footwear Association, which is hosting the awards. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So I want to get from you the lay of the land. Um, you represent a number of brands in the apparel and footwear space. What are they most encouraged about right now, and how has that changed o over the past year or two? Well, there's um, still a very strong consumer. Consumers are out, they're in force, um, they're buying. Uh, consumers are choosy, right? And there's a lot of things they've got to choose from to manage their dollars. Um, inflation is still pretty high, so things are expensive. So that doesn't mean they have as much money to spend on fashion, but they have more wages. So there's, you know, they're in a, they're in a relatively strong position. And, and we're hoping that, you know, consumers, as they are, you know, continuing to be choosy, continuing to exercise their right to drive our consumer-driven economy, that they'll still be out in force. Okay, so the e economic backdrop is looking pretty good, and that's encouraging. Um, what we've learned over the past couple of years is the pandemic really exposed the vulnerability of the global supply chain, uh, supply chains, plural. Most footwear and apparel sold in the U.S. is imported. We know that. So when brands say that they're diversifying their supply chains, what does that look like in practice? Is it more replacing China completely with other Asian countries or Central American countries, or is it reshoring what was done overseas to the U.S.? It involves all of that. There's a big diversification for a variety of reasons. And, you know, one of the things that we're looking for in Washington, and we spend a lot of our time in Washington talking to policymakers, is crafting a trade policy that helps support that, that diversification, whether it's, you know, supporting trade that's going on in Central America, mm -hmm. um, in Africa, in Haiti, um, really trying to give companies more options to be able to source, to be able to have those, you know, those resilient supply chains that we've been talking about. So the political disruption that we see in a lot of those Central American countries with um, presidents having to step down or gangs overtaking the country. What does that mean for your, your brands? People have to pay very close attention to um, any kinds of disruption, whether it's political disruption. Of course, the big thing right now we're dealing with is the logistics um, issues. You know, we've got um, the attacks in the Red Sea, the Panama Canal is disrupted. The East Coast ports are going through a labor negotiation. The last time we had a labor negotiation in the West Coast ports, that dragged on for a long time and resulted in disruption and some delays. So, you know, we're spending a lot of time trying to get policymakers to kind of focus their attention to try to, you know, smooth, ease those disruptions, you know, make sure that that those problems don't continue to materialize or have other knock on effects. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's so many people in this planet, really everybody gets touched by clothing and shoes, people that work, people that wear it. And we have to make sure that, you know, they still have the ability to, you know, have this industry support their lives and livelihoods. I'm glad you mentioned the dock workers in the East Coast and Gulf Coast ports, because if there is no new contract signed this fall, they might just strike. And I know your group has called upon the White House to step in and inter intervene. What are the actual workarounds for the industry if there is a work stoppage? So if there's a work stoppage, that means folks start looking at the West Coast as an option. And one of the frustrating pieces about that is over the last couple of years, people have diversified from the West Coast to the East Coast, right? So now we've got to go back to the West Coast again. We love the West Coast ports. There's a lot of strength there, but you know, strong, resilient supply chains mean you don't kind of put all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the positive developments as a result of the pandemic. And so if we see some dynamic in the East Coast that kind of makes people have to rethink that, I think then we're kind of going backwards. Yeah, you're always constantly trying to uh, whack a mole, right? You, you can't hit it at the same time. I want to ask about trade policy. Is it sure. too early right now for bra your brands to make plans in anticipation of increased sanctions um, under a potential second Trump presidency? People are, are modeling that right now. You know, we're still actually um, laboring under the tariffs that former President Trump imposed that President Biden retained. Actually, he's collected more tariffs under his term that President Trump collected under his own. 
And you know, one of the problems that we came out as a result of that is, you know, this was an effort to try to get you know Beijing to China to change their their policies. Right. We've never been successful in convincing um, you know Beijing to change their behavior by making it more expensive for Americans to get dressed every day. But that's what tariffs do, right? Tariffs are mm -hmm. costs that are paid by importers, and ultimately, you know, most companies will end up passing that cost along to consumers. We're seeing inflation right now, right? So yeah. as, as we're looking at ways to cut inflation, to keep inflation under control, uh, tariff policy and trying to squeeze some of those regressive, outdated, and even misogynistic tariffs away from um, our trade policy would be a great idea. What's the average amount of exposure a brand has to China sourced raw material today versus, say, five years ago? It's actually a lot lower. There has been a you know, sourcing diversification, probably the biggest in a generation, where companies have looked at you know, Vietnam, India, countries in Africa, countries in Central America, mm -hmm. and, and, and they want to continue that, right? That's what we want to sort of build for. That's why we're looking for trade policy to do that. All right. And you are, of course, the man in Washington to help them do just that. Steve Lamar, president and CEO of the American Apparel and Footwear Association. Thanks so much for joining us. Today. Thank you. All right, we uh, do want to turn to some corporate news because earnings continue to roll in. Lennar, the home builder, just reporting results in the last couple of minutes. Uh, fiscal first quarter adjusted EPS of $2.57, beating the average analyst estimate of $2.21. The revenue line, $7.31 billion. That is a miss, lighter than what had been anticipated, which was $7.42 billion. As for the commentary for this current quarter, Lennar sees second quarter new orders of 20900 to 21300 the consensus estimate is for 20,547. So that is better than the, the consensus estimate. Second quarter deliveries, anywhere from 19,000 to 19,500. Uh, analysts were looking for just under 19,000. For more, let's bring in Simone Foxman, who's been looking through the results as well. And Simone, this is a stock that's trading at record highs. So um, what what is the after hours trade and what does that tell you about these results? Yeah, just about record highs. We did see a little bit come off uh, this uh, stock today. Uh, so yesterday was the record high close. Um, but that said, we're seeing a little bit of weakness in the after hours. But it does seem like most analysts were just really bullish on this stock. Uh, there are two sell ratings, but uh, that's just a fraction of the overall ratings on this name. I think about 14 or 15 buy ratings going into this earnings. What analysts had wanted to see, they wanted to see, uh, they wanted to confirm some earlier signs that the housing market is turning around for these home builders. Note that the fourth quarter for many of these home builders included October. And you remember what happened in October, November. Yeah. Uh, interest rates shot up 7, 8 percent on a 30 year fixed mortgage. They came back down in December uh, into January. We've seen a little bit of a change in recent weeks. So they wanted to see evidence from Lennar that that's turning around. They are seeing for the second quarter now new orders 20,900 to 21,300. That is uh, well above the average estimate, which was 20,500. So maybe that's what we're seeing. We're seeing uh, the market try and grapple with, okay, how good is is, are these results really? Absolutely. And I'm so glad you mentioned what happened in October when rates shot up. And of course, mortgage rates have been a big, big sticking point for aspiring homeowners. Um, so much so that we know the home builders have had to offer incentives. What kind of commentary can we expect to hear from the company when it comes to those mortgage buy downs? Yeah, I think we can expect to hear some color on the call. Note that the price here has been pressured, which means uh, that either these buy downs aren't necessarily attractive <laughs> enough or there just simply aren't that many people um, out there. We will uh, kind of try and get a sense from the company of how long they're going to have to do these buy down yeah. programs. Not that the average sales price was 413000 in this quarter, but they do expect to see it tick back up, which suggests more demand in the market. Maybe you don't need this. I will say margins remain pretty high, coming in better than expectations. Um, so if you look ahead to potentially a, a market moving, maybe Lennar is starting to see that really turn around. All right, fantastic context. And of course, uh, Lennar will be holding its earnings conference call as well. If there are any major headlines, we will bring those to you. Simone Foxman, thank you so much.
All right, uh, we mentioned that Lennar currently a little bit lower in the after hours trade, but let's take a look at how markets closed on the day. The S&P 500 also retreating from record highs. We have some big data points tomorrow. Uh, wholesale inflation, that is PPI, on the heels of a somewhat hotter than expected CPI report earlier this week, and also retail sales, which will give us a sense of how the consumer is faring. Uh, within the big tech world, uh, you had Tesla, a big, big drag there. So that pulled the group down by three quarters of 1%. Uh, worth noting as well, uh, Bitcoin did move higher, 73,081. So it continues to move up uh, ahead of that happening in April. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Washington getting some stuff done. The House of Representatives today passing a bill that would ban the video app TikTok over concerns of Chinese data mining. Joining us now from Washington is Bloomberg Balance of Power co-host Kaylee Line. So the House um, pushed it forward. We know that President Biden says he's ready to sign this bill if it uh, makes it to his desk. The future, though, in the Senate of this bill is a little bit less certain. What do we know so far? Well, we haven't really gotten much clue from the man who, frankly, leads the Senate. The Senate Majority Leader, Chuck Schumer, just said in a statement after this bill passed the House by 352 to 65 against. This was a wide bipartisan margin that passed this bill to send it uh, to Schumer and the members of that body. Schumer just said the Senate will review the legislation when it comes over from the House. So it's not exactly a ringing endorsement. And we do know that there are some senators who have come out against this legislation with concerns over free speech, the naming of a private company specifically uh, in a piece of legislation. So it's really not clear that it will move forward. If it does, though, pass the Senate, uh, we heard from Corinne Jean-Pierre, the White House press secretary today, who said they hope the Senate will take action on the bill. They want to see it be on a strong legal footing. But therein lies the problem, Scarlett. Even if President Biden were able to sign this into law, it is highly likely that it will face many legal challenges, not just from TikTok, but from other advocates. There's also the question of China, because it would need to sign off on ByteDance divesting uh, from TikTok. China has called the House move today uh, bullying. Bullying behavior is how they refer to it. So that may be a bit of a snag. There's also the question of even if China were to say yes, who would buy TikTok? Who mm -hmm. could buy TikTok? This is valued in the hundreds of billions of dollars. It would take a really large company to absorb that kind of asset. And when it comes to big tech in particular, there is a serious antitrust concern, particularly with this administration that is so focused on competition. It's hard to see how a big tech company getting bigger to that degree would pass that that scrutiny. Yeah, it's a very, very sticky situation here. The other thing, of course, is that um, voting to ban or force the sale of TikTok might mean uh, turning young voters against whoever is in, elect is in office, whether that would be uh, President Biden or um, the potential nominee, President, former President Trump, who has now turned his stance on TikTok around and says that he no longer supports this ban. Yeah, even though he did when he was president suggest that a ban should uh be in place because of national security concerns. But we do know that people close to Trump, including Kellyanne Conway, who was a former uh, senior aide to him when he was president, works for uh, an organization that has been advocating for TikTok on Capitol Hill. And Jeff Yass, who is a big Republican donor and an investor in TikTok, also has recently met with the former president. So there's a question of the degree of influence individuals like that may be having um, on his thinking and to what extent that may show up in Republican senators' attitude toward this legislation. It certainly did in the House vote, only 16 Republicans did not vote for this bill today, which shows maybe the former president didn't have that much sway over their attitude. But the Senate could be a, a bit of a different question. And to your point on young voters, it's worth pointing out the Biden campaign is on TikTok. So we could be talking about a president here who is signing into law something mm -hmm. that could see it banned if the divestiture doesn't happen, while also trying to reach young voters through the platform, at least for the period in which he would be able to. It, it, it's very interesting. Scar. Yeah, it creates a lot of interesting optics and it gets meta very quickly here. Bloomberg's Kelly Lines, <laughs> thank you so much. Kelly will be back at the top of the hour with Joe Matthew for Balance of Power. Now still ahead, we're going to tell you what you need to prepare for, to watch for in anticipation of tomorrow's trade. This is The Close on Bloomberg.
All right, we're here to set you up for the trading day tomorrow. And one big thing investors will be watching is Adobe because it is coming out with results after the closing bell. So let's bring in now the co-host of Bloomberg Technology, Ed Ludlow, for a little bit more on what we can anticipate. And Ed, we know Adobe is likely to report another quarter of double-digit sales gains. This is something that Adobe has been pretty consistent with. So the bar is pretty high. Yeah, the bar's pretty high. I mean, it would be the third straight quarter of double-digit gains. And, like, the world hasn't changed. We still open PDFs and still use creative tools online. And, you know, Adobe kind of has cornered that market. You always get surprised. If you go on Stat, Stat Go on the Bloomberg Terminal, look at where Adobe sits uh, in its market cap relative to others. It's a really big company. But we want to see evidence that it's AI offering. Firefly AI in particular, text-to-image technology is starting to gain, gain traction as, as a commercial offering. And the worry is, like, if you look at this big body of very well-funded AI startups that have text-to-image tools, everyone's kind of doing the same thing. And there's not a lot of conviction out there that Adobe's Firefly mm -hmm. is any better than anything else anyone else is offering. Like OpenAI, for instance. How does this set Adobe up uh, when it's competing against the likes of OpenAI? Yeah, so the most recent development in that is that Firefly AI and, and DALI 3 are very similar in terms of what you can achieve. The difference is OpenAI has a text-to-video platform in Sora. And so when that ha happened in mid-February, there was this knee-jerk reaction in Adobe. And it's like, oh, no, when is Adobe's text-to-video tool coming? And I think most of the market think this is something that's more than a year away. So if they said anything about that on the call, that would be really interesting um, in terms of where they put money. And speaking of money, they got a bit to play with now that the Figma deal's fallen through. And you kind of wonder, like, what do you do with $20 billion that mm -hmm. you were going to spend and now you're not? Now you're not because, of course, regulators got in the way of that. But, you know, it's been a theme, uh, a, you know, kind of a trendy in tech lately to pay a dividend or increase your dividend or buy back stocks. So that's always something we can watch for. Ed Ludlow, thank you so much. Bloomberg Technology co-host Ed Ludlow giving us a preview of what we can expect from Adobe when it reports earnings tomorrow after the bell. Let's take a look at what else we're watching for on the calendar tomorrow. There's a quite a bit of economic data, and this is why, in part, stocks kind of floundered before uh, the trade tomorrow. You have PPI, wholesale inflation, on the heels of a CPI report that was slightly hotter than anticipated. Retail sales, as well, for the month of February is coming out. And we get the weekly jobless claims, which is a high-frequency data point, of course, the labor market has been holding up pretty firmly. We also have the Greenwich Economic Forum in Miami. Romain Bostic will be attending that, and he'll be speaking with a number of guests, including Churchill Asset Management CEO Ken Kensell, as well as Guggenheim co-president Dina DiLorenzo and the philanthropist Frank McCourt. So you'll want to keep it tuned to Bloomberg Television all day for those conversations. And... The earnings parade continues. We have Dollar General reporting tomorrow. Uh, that'll be before the bell. Of course, Dollar Tree uh, came out today and indicated it is closing about 1,000 stores. That stock was one of the worst performers in the S&P 500. We're going to get a further read on the state of the consumer, uh, especially when it comes to sporting goods and uh, athletic wear. Dick's Sporting Goods will be announcing results. Ulta Beauty, also another company coming out with its earnings. And as we mentioned earlier, Adobe uh, giving us the read on how it's monetizing AI and the demand for AI right now. That does it for us. Balance of Power is up next on Bloomberg Television. Have a great evening. This was The Close.